Uh, good morning, uh, wherever you are. Um, so given that going outside is not uh, something that uh, um, uh, we've been doing quite as much of as we've uh, been. I thought I'd uh, start with a nice picture um, from the outside. Um, and the ambitions of the talk, um, quite simply, what we talk about when we talk about unit testing. Um, this style, this um, patterning of words, what we talk about when we talk about, uh, actually comes from an American author, Raymond Carver, and he wrote a story, um, I think it was the 1960s, possibly 50s, uh, what we talk about when we talk about love. And uh, it's, it's a nice little short story if you happen to like reading short fiction. Um, but this is one of those things that I have found uh, it's one of those challenges, um, and it's a challenge worth discussing because we use a lot of terms. It's not unique to unit testing, but in software development, we use a lot of terms and we assume that when we use those words, that that plants exactly the same idea in somebody else's head. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, this point about communication turns out to be quite important and is going to be central to one of the things that I think is important about unit testing. But I also want to look a little bit at the history of unit testing. Um, and uh, why does a definition matter? I also point out the fact that there is no perfect definition, but there are useful definitions. Uh, so as Andre said, I've um, uh, written a bunch of stuff. So by the way, my uh, Twitter handle is um, surprisingly easy. It is just my name. Uh, this is one of the benefits of giving your children internet unique names. I've done this for my children. Um, I co-authored um, uh, some books on patterns and software architecture a number of years ago. Um, Andre mentioned 97 things every program should know. I edited this uh, just about 10 years ago. Uh, and then this month, um, uh, it was released from O'Reilly, 97 things every Java program should know. And I co-edited that with Trisha G. And what is interesting, particularly in this and this, uh, is the number of contributions people make about testing. And I will confess that I contributed some pieces to my own books um, and I've contributed pieces on testing in both of these, but it's more interesting what other people contribute and the ideas and thoughts that they have. So we're gonna examine some core words, some basic ideas here. <coughs> Test, what do we mean by that? Yeah. It's a question. Unit, this is the tricky one. What do we mean by that? I'm also going to throw in, because I'm feeling generous, an extra word that we care about. Good. What do we mean by a good unit test? When we say good, I think we normally want something that's good, but good is not a, good is not a constructive word. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not clear what it means on its own. Uh, you don't get people sitting around um, having a meeting, discussing, okay, we're going to do the next release and uh, there's going to be a lot of new development work. Right, so what architecture should we choose? I know we should choose a good architecture. And everybody goes, that's brilliant. We didn't think of that. We should choose a good architecture. Um, what practices should we use? Good practices. Perfect. What coding style? We should use a good coding style. Yeah, I, this word is almost content free. It's a shorthand. We need to open it up, as it were, double click on the word good and see where it takes us. So let's start off with a very simple measure. Um, it's a quote from Scott Ambler. Um, if it's worth building, it's worth testing. If it's not worth testing, why are you wasting your time working on it? Now, it's not that there is code that I, um, I write that I don't um, write tests for. I do. There's loads of code that I write that I don't write tests for. Um, so if I'm messing around in uh, something like Python and I'm just trying something, I will pull up uh, the Python interpreter and I'll experiment with stuff. Um, the purpose of that code was not to go into production. The purpose of that code was not to be read by somebody else. Um, the purpose of that code was not even to be checked in. The purpose of that code was to explore something and get an idea, uh, get an understanding. So there are cases you don't want to do this, but unless you ask the question, you won't know what those are. So what we're really exploring here is um, a concept of value. What is the value of this code? To whom does it provide some kind of value? And if somebody says, oh, you know, it's fine, we're going to pay millions of euros for this product, but don't worry about testing, you have to kind of think, well, that's not a very good use of money. If you have a manager that says we're not going to worry about testing, then why are they a manager? Or what is it that they're managing? Because a product manager should absolutely want the product that they are creating to be 
you know, of sound quality. Now, there's another thing that we also need to go through, a series of misconceptions, if you like. Um, let's pick one of the classic ones from Dijkstra. Uh, and to try and understand it, because I sometimes get this one quoted back at me, and often by people who have not really understood the implications. When I say, when people say, oh, well, you know, we should write more tests, somebody will normally quote Dijkstra and say, yeah, well, program testing can only be used to show the presence of bugs, but never show their absence. What? That's not a reason to not test. It, it, what it does is it tells you the boundaries. We should always have some confidence um, uh, in what we're doing, but we're not looking for perfection. If you're looking for perfection in testing, you will always be disappointed. I can guarantee you that. But what we're saying here, the goal of program testing is not to show the presence of, um, is not to show the um, absence. It's not to say this system works perfectly. It is to increase our confidence and to get a sense to say, given our testing, we have um, found a few bugs and that is representative of the whole. What we find actually statistically is that your bug rate will tell you the kind of bug rate you can expect in future and across the code base. Uh, and if you have a, if you ever go through um, uh, that kind of dysfunctional approach that people used to, well, that some people still do, the beta testing phase, where they basically say, right, well, we're just going to throw the code together, then give it to the customers, and they will do the testing for us. What you will find is that they won't go through all of the bugs. What they will do is they will find representative cases, and you will have those kinds of bugs throughout the lifetime of the product, uh, typically. So this is not a reason to not test. What it does is it just lets you know that testing will not be the answer to all of your problems. Um, but it does tell us why we want it. It's a question of confidence. We need to increase our confidence. If I have no tests, I can have no confidence. Um, in fact, I, I know somebody who very rarely ever compiled their code. They had complete confidence in their code, um, so much so that they didn't feel the need to compile it. They were normally very surprised when they tried to compile it. So confidence, how do we get our confidence? Well, basic advice. So I'm going to borrow from um, Andy Hunt and Dave Thomas. Uh, in their 1999 classic, The Pragmatic Programmer, uh, which just was re-released to the 20th year anniversary last year, um, very simple mantra, a very simple three-part rule. Test early, test often, test automatically. If testing is such a good idea, why are you going to leave it till the end? Because if you're leaving it to the end, there's an implicit assumption. You don't even know you have it, but there is an implicit assumption. If you leave it to the end, there's an implicit assumption it works. Um, because otherwise, why would you leave it to the end? If it's the last thing you're going to do, it must mean that you have confidence that everything is working because there's no other time after that. So this is interesting because um, this is, uh, if you put testing at the end of a, uh, a process, whether it's a personal process or a whole team development process, it implicitly says, we have confidence this works. This testing is to confirm that belief. It is not to fix anything or anything big. We're just gonna clean a few things. So putting testing last is a public statement that we know this works. Now, it is possible to get to that position, but it turns out the only way to do that is if you've tested early and often. Get in there, keep doing it. It should be continuous. And if we're going to do that, it should be automatic. Um, and this is much more obvious for, for unit testing, but we can say it also applies to system level testing. But this idea is that this continuity, over time we have been moving to a position where things have become progressively more continuous. It used to be that you would write the code. In fact, you would write it, you would write it on a pad, you'd write, fill out a coding form. You'd hand it off to somebody else. They would go and punch cards. Those cards would quite literally be compiled. That's what compiling means in English. You put things together in a pile. They would be compiled and you would they would put library code in literally from a library it's not a metaphor if you needed a mathematical function somebody would go and say here are the cards for that function and they would insert it into the deck of compiled cards and then that would be processed and then the next morning you get a result as to how things compiled now we don't work like that anymore everything has become much more continuous we work within our environments. Um, you know, many environments, they will do incremental compilation in the background. There is no separate compile step um, for the developer in most of their work. The same can be also considered to be true of testing. We know testing has historically been put back as a phase. And people have often said, oh, well, unit testing 
We do that at the end of the coding phase. Well, first of all, let's get rid of these ideas of phases. But let's also recognize that testing is not a separate activity that you do afterwards, just as if I'm writing uh, Java code or C-sharp code, putting semicolons is not an activity that I leave to the end of the day. I don't write my code and then at the end of the day add the semicolons. The idea is we need to do this much more continuously. Now, I think we're, we're quite used to that idea, and CICD pipelines make that more normal. But this is also not a new idea. And I've just quoted 1999, but I want to go back further. I want to go back to uh, kind of the height of the Cold War here. The 1968 NATO Software Engineering Conference in Garmisch, Germany. It's quite famous. Um, it uh, helped popularize the term software engineering. It didn't invent the term software engineering. That was developed by Margaret Hamilton, um, who uh, worked for MIT on the Apollo software. Um, but what is interesting is reading this document. When you read this document, you suddenly discover that people were not necessarily advocating. We must plan everything and do everything um, and separate things into phases. And I'm not saying that they predicted everything in the future, but it turns out there was a lot of very clear thinking. And there are certain themes that appear and reappear um, throughout uh, the conference. Um, let me give you one. A software system can best be designed if the testing is interlaced with the designing instead of being used after the design. In other words, the idea is don't, you know, design and develop and then test. You do these interlaced, interwoven. It's Alan Perlis, the um, first winner of the Turing Award. So uh, there's a, a deep idea here. Um, we can also see if you take this to a um, if you if you dial this to a much more continuous a genuinely continuous approach you don't just interleave within the week or within the day what we're saying here is interleave from minute to minute across the hours um, this gives us test driven development or specifically the test first cycle in test driven development um, now it's normally presented as something like this red uh, green refactor uh, and red is normally thought of as write a test that fails green make the right enough code to make the test pass refactor revise the code and the test. I have never found this particularly motivating, and I think this is also what confuses a lot of people. I like test-driven development a lot. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, uh, teaching people and helping teams work with it. I use it myself. It seems a very natural way to develop um, uh, things after you've got the habit. Um, but it doesn't feel very natural if the first thing you tell somebody is, hey, guess what? Write something that doesn't work. What? That, that, that anybody can write something that doesn't work. The challenge here is to try something that does. And that is perhaps because we've oversimplified this. Um, let's elaborate. Write a test case for new behavior. That's your goal. It's not to get read, it's to write new behavior. As it's new, the test either fails to compile or fails to pass. We'll consider both of those failure. So notice then we shift. Green is not just making the test pass, it's write the code to fulfill the requirement. Notice what we've done here is we've shifted this to be much more of a specification oriented cycle. It feels much more natural instead of saying write something that doesn't work to say specify what you want and then build it. Specify what you want then build it. Well yes of course because that makes sense. We ask for something and then before we receive it, specify what the code should look like. Show me the code that should pass. Show me how it's used. Show me your expectations. At that point, it suddenly makes sense. And we've you can see a much stronger connection to the general approach to how we are we state a requirement and then fulfill it, but also how we have whiteboard discussions. Let me show you the code that I would think we should write. I'm giving you an expectation there. I think it should do this in this case. The problem is the whiteboard doesn't compile it. We're just moving that into the window where we can do that. Um, now, sometimes people struggle with that, still struggle with that, but there's another, there's a, there's a kind of another extreme that people find themselves at. Sometimes people religiously look at the red and green cycle and that's it. They don't do the refactoring. In other words, they end up with this really nasty code, really, messy, um, clunky code that just accumulated through these cycles without revision. Um, there's a quote, I'm trying to remember who, uh, it possibly was Ernest Hemingway, but their, their, their classic quote on writing was writing is rewriting. We have missed out the revision step here. We're just going red, green, red, green, red, green, and we're building up, we're accumulating technical debt without revising what we're doing. This is not how to use the test first cycle. I've also seen a very strict interpretation um, 
somebody spoke to me after a, a conference session a few years ago they came up to me and they said what do you do when there's nothing to do in the third step and the, like, they weren't going to wait for my answer and they said what i do is i always make a small change that has no effect and then the next time round the loop i change it back this is pointless it's not the refactor is not a command it's a question and this is one of the most important things you will notice that earlier a few minutes ago i put question marks on things because for me the most important thing that we're doing is we are asking questions a question will take you thing uh, take you somewhere the question here is do we need to refactor and if so what should we do about it so let me offer you a different cycle one that works whether you're doing tdd but one that also works at the larger scale whether you are spreading your testing out in a different way because when we say unit testing we don't necessarily mean tdd uh, for some people when they say unit testing they say oh yeah 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 that means tdd i don't i'm not i'm not assuming that i might have a preference for it but i'm not assuming it i want to offer you something that whichever level of time scale you're working at makes sense and this is actually quite an old cycle it's the deming shuart cycle um sometimes it's phrased as plan do check act i don't really go for that term interpretation that's not my preferred one my preferred interpretation is plan do study act which is the original formulation and this is actually quite a good description of any empirical process um, any process of inquiry and discovery and refinement where we're dealing things with things that are incompletely known the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to say here's our plan here is our hypothesis this is what we're going to try and build the next thing i'm going to do is carry it out actually make it so the next thing I'm going to do is review what I've done. Take a, take a stop, slow down. This is why I prefer the word study to the word check, because um, study sounds um, slower. It is. Check sounds very quick and cursory. Let's just check it's okay. Yep, look, all it's good. Move on. Study means you need to spend deliberate, intelligent time. What's going on here? Look at the code. Is there a pattern to the problems we're experiencing or is there a pattern of duplication or do we seem to be writing a lot of uh, a lot of boilerplate code um, you know or there are questions i have about the architecture or there's some questions that are not clear now i'm getting into the requirements there's some edge cases the whole point here is to slow down to stop now a lot of people are afraid of this i'm going to come back to speed in a moment as a concern they're afraid of the idea of of um, slowing down Whereas I'm actually saying, no, no, if you, this is the whole point, study and then make your plan. Now I'm going to act. This is what we're going to do. We can bring this right, right back into the TDD cycle. Right, write a test. Here is the thing I want to do. Here is my plan. It's a little piece of code. I want it to work. Reify. It's not a common English word, but what it basically means is make it real. Make it into a thing. Thingify, if you like. So make it so. Reflect. Take a step back, look, what's going on? What are the trends? What are the questions you have? What are the gaps? Refactor. So I tend to think that if we split that refactor step into the two steps, that it makes it much, much clearer. Uh, indeed, I, I tweeted a couple of years ago um, a different way of looking at this. Again, I, I quite like this a way of looking at approaching things by finding better questions. I'm, of course, the answers are interesting, but ultimately I think we should be searching for better questions. They will serve us much better when it comes to software development. Uh, so how to think about the test first cycle in TDD. Your first step is what does success look like? What, show me the thing that you think should work. What is the simplest thing that could possibly work? Let's not build too much into the back. Then take a step back. Are there any gaps, repetitions, inconsistencies, trends, or questions? And then how would you address them? So what we're doing is we're making it explicit. It's a process of inquiry. Testing is a process of inquiry, and we're binding it together with the code. It's not that the tests and the code are some kind of separate thing. We're working on them together. One is a reflection of what we believe the other should do. These grow together. And whether we grow them minute to minute or day to day, however large our cycles are, we've got that. And specifically what we're doing is we're gathering knowledge and and uh, and we're, we're making use of that. And acquiring knowledge sounds very fancy, it's just learning. And then we are expressing, here's what we think this code should do. This is my understanding of this. Now, this terminology aspect, we also find um, there's an observation from Alistair Coburn a number of years ago um, 
the way that we misuse words, and I've, I've seen this in teams, um, I've encountered teams saying, oh, we're doing TDD, and then you look at it and they're not doing TDD. They're doing a lot of unit testing and that's really good. Or perhaps they're doing a lot of integration testing. But the point is they're doing a lot of testing and perhaps they're doing more testing than they used to, but they don't really have a word for what it is that they're doing. But they've come across this term test-driven development and, you know, it's it, the, the word drive kind of really motivates them and say, yeah, they say, well, we're doing TDD. And that's not really what they're doing. What they're actually doing is this lovely term guts. I have good unit tests. They're making a statement not about how they're doing something, but about what is left behind. Guts, good unit tests. Now, this takes us straight back to that question. What do we mean by good? I'm going to give you a very simple definition of what I've described as a bare minimum definition. I can't give you a URL for this because this is actually currently in an article that I'm a blog post that I'm writing. So um, if you're following me, I'm also on Medium um, as at Kevlin Henney. I'm hoping that I will get enough time next week to finish the blog post. I'm revisiting an old uh, piece from 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, and I'm expanding it. And I've got this very simple definition that I'm I put in there. Um, the bare minimum definition of what we mean by good test. This is not the complete, but just good test. What do we mean by good? When the code is doing the right thing, the tests pass. When a test fails, it means the code is doing the wrong thing. We're very carefully saying that when the code, when the tests pass, it doesn't mean the code works, but we are saying that code that works should pass. We are also saying that when it fails, it should mean the code is wrong. It should not mean and this is the problem with brittle unit tests or any form of brittle test. Um, sometimes people find that they've got tests, then they refactor the code, they improve the code, they, perhaps they change the performance, they change a number of data structures, they change some decisions about the code, they change the libraries that they use, and then suddenly the tests fail. And they don't, and failure doesn't mean your code is wrong in this case, it means you change something. And this is the worst thing. The worst thing is when a test fails because you made things better. When you make things better, the test should acknowledge that and say, yep, it's still green. Uh, having a test fail because you made something better is definitely not what tests are for. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. A test, when it fails, should say there is a thing that is wrong. And anything that works, it should accept. It's as simple as that. That is the basic, the bare minimum. Now, I mentioned writing before. I've mentioned a couple of writers, Raymond Carver, Ernest Hemingway, and so on. And I've mentioned this idea of writing. I'm going to pick on another writer, um, uh, William Zinser. And he, he helps us with the definition of good um, that we can actually take advantage of. Four basic premises of writing, okay? Clarity, it should be clear. Brevity, should be sure, okay? Don't, don't, don't spend all your time trying to say something that you could say in this space. It should be simple. When we are writing code, but particularly I want to focus on the test. When we are writing our tests, they do need to be simple because they are, uh, we want to have confidence that they work. Again, that word confidence. If I make my tests more complex than my production code, there is a very high probability that bugs are in my tests, not in my code. There's a very high probability that when a test fails, it's not because there's something wrong with the code, but where there's something wrong with the test. So there is a simple question here. Let us make the test simpler than the code so that even when they are wrong, we can see that. And something else, a really simple thing. We are human. You are, you are not writing tests for a CICD pipeline. You're writing them for somebody else. Uh, this point was made very clear and uh, articulated very well um, in a piece by uh, uh, Jeremy Zaros um, uh, in 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. Um, the title says everything you need, really. Write tests for people. <laughs> um, that's, that's the target audience. Um, who should be writing tests for? Let's be more specific. For the person trying to understand your code. Specifically, what he's saying here is for the person trying to understand your production code. Now, that's interesting because sometimes we think of the tests. I'm writing my tests for the person who is going to read the tests. No, no, no. We're saying, actually, good tests act as documentation for the code that they are testing. This is another point of good. I want my test to do more than just check the code. Um, I, I've understood that in some... Um, some testing circles, um, uh, the context-driven uh, folk tend to try and use the word check to refer to unit testing and to kind of belittle it. Absolutely not. If you think unit testing is just checking, you need to 
watch this talk because that's not what we talk about when we talk about unit testing. Um, uh, they are also documentation. They are an act of communication. They offer somebody else to read. And this also tells us that when we are working with our unit tests, if we're doing code reviews, um, so, so let us just say you're in an organization, you're changing things, you think, okay, we should probably spend more time reviewing code and you either do that in person or you do it impersonally uh, via pull requests and so on. Um, and you focus on the code. And then somebody says, well, look, we need to really emphasize our tests and perhaps you're getting better at the testing and that's great. So you've got some tests and you review those one day. <laughs> Don't review them separately, review them together. Your tests show you the outside aspect. Now, this is interesting because this outside inside aspect is also something that we see from another point of view, but I also want to differentiate a couple of other terms that we often use. So if you have all of your software, when there is a very simple idea of, of the whole, a system test, I'm going to call it a system test or a software test. And we use, sometimes the, a company will use the term software test or system test to mean something specific. Um, given that there is not one unique definition of it, that's absolutely fine. But I want to clarify well, how I'm using it here. By that, I mean it is a test of the software as a whole, as it would be experienced by a user, as would be tested by somebody who wants to um, confirm the functionality of the product as a whole. It is done without reference to the code and without skills in the code. It may be um, informed by a domain expert but you are treating the software as a product, not as um, a set of constructed artifacts. These we refer to as programmer tests. It's a, those are code tests. The term programmer testing has become popular um, uh, because it emphasizes the role. And this includes unit tests, but it's not just unit tests. It also includes things like performance testing, uh, integrated testing, and so on. Um, what I find interesting is that sometimes people still push back against this, um, this idea that, you know, oh no, programmers shouldn't test their own code. You need somebody else to do that. But what I found is interesting is that even when you go through the traditional um, testing community, so Rex Black is kind of old school testing, I'd say, very thorough. Um, this book was published uh, nearly 20 years ago, it's 2003, if I recall correctly. Uh, critical testing processes, and you read through it and you go, there's a very almost traditional way of thinking about testing, but he's in, he's in no doubt as to the role that programmers should play. If he's a traditional test consultant, and uh, he was saying nearly 20 years ago, very, very clearly, I find the projects I work on usually go more smoothly when programmers do some unit testing of their own code. Through the ascendance of approaches like extreme programming, such position, uh, such a position is becoming less controversial. Now, the common objection to this, people say, well, look, you know, that's gonna slow me down. Um, it, it's going to slow me down. It's going to waste my time. And this is a this is a difficult area because humans have a very poor relationship with time. We're really bad at understanding how we spread our activities and the value of spending time on things. So many practices, um, testing included, um, and testing of interest here, uh, have this property of slowing down. You remember I said when talking about the PDSA cycle, the S study sounds slower, and this is a good thing. <laughs> So I came across this um, observation nearly 25 years ago from somebody, why do cars have brakes? And what I like about this question, again, we're with the questions. What I like about this question is that it has an answer that is obvious. And that obvious answer is also correct. Cars have brakes so you can slow down. That is the obvious answer that is correct. There is also another answer that is not as obvious, but is also correct. Cars have, uh, cars have brakes so you can go fast. Why would you, if somebody said, hey, here, my car, you can have the keys to my car, take it for a drive. Oh, brilliant. Anything I should know? Oh, yeah, it has no brakes. The brakes aren't working. Oh, no, thank you very much. You can have your keys back. I don't want to go in that car. Cars have brakes so you can go fast. Imagine how fast you would want to go if you knew you couldn't decelerate. You'd be either not getting in the car or incredibly cautious driving around everywhere in first gear. Um, and so it, it, this is how we need to think about many of our practices. Those practices are there to slow you down. And that is a good thing because that is what will allow you to go fast. And this is, as I said, we have a difficult 
relationship with um, with time. Slowing down over the minutes is what speeds us up over the days and the years. And that is where software products are developed. They are not developed in the minutes. Our actions are in the minutes and we live in the present tense, but we need to understand the relationship between these things. Now, this is really hard in a world where everybody's encouraging you to move fast. You know, a lot of people oversimplify and misunderstand agile development and lean development is just go faster, go faster. And you have this kind of mantra, move fast and break things. That's a terrible thing. I'm gonna say move slow and mend things. There are cases when you want to move fast and break things, but most of the time your movement should be slow because that will deliver something. In fact, I'm using, although we talked about fast, I, I want to refine that term a little bit more. The goal here is not to do, deliver and develop faster, deliver sooner, not faster. Again, it's a subtle distinction, but it's quite important because we see this in many teams when they are looking to work with their activities or cut their activities. Somebody who is focusing on testing and suddenly discovers, you know, this testing is taking, I can't go as fast as I used to. Yeah, but you're getting things out sooner. That's the thing that matters. And you get a lot of people being very busy. Perhaps they're busy debugging. Perhaps they're busy typing. Perhaps they're busy writing lines that do not need to be written and misunderstanding things that perhaps if they slowed down, they would be able to ask somebody a question about or reflect on and realize there's a simpler or an alternative interpretation. A uh, book by an artist, uh, Austin Cleon, Keep Going. Um, well, I, I love this book. I, I like uh, it's Austin Cleon's third book. Uh, I think he's got a lot of advice that um, I find very helpful. Um, it's, you know, I, at one level, software development is an art, and so therefore we can learn from artists. As he says, it's impossible to pay proper attention to your life if you're hurtling along at lightning speed. When your job is to see things other people don't, you have to slow down enough. You can actually look. And I'm going to say that as a developer, your job is to see things other people don't. You need specific activities that offer you that insight. And this is an interesting observation uh, in parallel made by Michael Feathers in a blog post he wrote 12 years ago, the flawed theory behind unit testing. The flawed theory is um, we unit test to find bugs. Um, and... Uh, we unit test to just make sure things work. And he says, no, no, in the software industry, we've been chasing quality for years. The interesting thing is there are a number of things that work. All of these techniques have been shown to increase quality. If we look closely, we can see why. All of them force us to reflect on our code. They are all about slowing down. They're all about making you think. Software development is applied thought. It is applied learning. It is applied knowledge. As he says, that's the magic. And it's why unit testing works also. When you write unit tests, TDD style, or after your development, you scrutinize, you think, and you often prevent problems without even encountering a test failure. And that, I think, is one of the most important things. One of the reasons we want to unit test and why developers should be unit testing their own code, whether they do it TDD style or not, doesn't matter, is that they are being forced into seeing their code from a different point of view. They are being forced to think, and that gives them a much deeper insight. So instead of spending their time debugging, debugging is the opposite of what's sometimes called end bugging. Putting pre we put the bugs in, end bugging, now we take them out. We need to get that out of software development. So what we're after here is a, 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 a kind of approach that is thorough. We have a term for that, software engineering. You can use other words if you like. Um, but one of the things going back through this document that I found when I read it um, a couple of years ago uh, that surprised me, um, these words appeared in the document. Now, they're not used throughout the document. They appear about one or two places. But I, this surprised me because up until, up until three years ago, I had assumed that the term unit test was a, uh, a term from the 1970s. Actually, it's a term from the 1960s. It, it is entirely possible it's a term from the 1950s. I just haven't got there yet. But it was clearly in uh, current use because they, uh, it was used without offering definition. When a term is new, we often will help people by defining it, but it was just used without context. Now, it, we can kind of get the sense that a lot of the time they were talking about unit, they were talking about the term module. And again, module is one of those terms that has a very elastic definition. People mean different things by it. If you look at things like the module, um, uh, uh, the modules feature of Java, 
or the modules feature of C++, they use the term module very differently to the way it's been used historically. It's generally, it just means a bit of code, a unit. Um, Turbo Pascal um, used to have a term unit that meant module. Um, uh, we, we kind of got the idea, maybe it's to do with the language. And, uh, and the term module is much more common in the 1968 paper. Um, here we see um, microservices invented a few years before their time. Um, this strategy requires the system be designed in modules, which can be realized, tested, and modified independently apart from conventions for intermodule communication. This idea of being able to test a module was quite profound. So unit and module were sometimes used interchangeably. If I pick another book, Glenford Byers, um, so this is my copy of his 1979 book, The Art of Software Testing. He makes, uh, he makes an equivalence there. He basically says that, you know, uh, module testing or unit testing, he regards them as equivalent, is a process of testing the individual subprograms, subroutines, or procedures in a program. So these are different constructs from different languages. Subprograms tend to be much larger, not quite what we would call a class, but more closer to what we call a modern module. But what is interesting here is um, that idea um, is, is there. He makes a, a kind of a simple equivalence. He also motivates as to why we want to do this we would manage the combinatrix of the whole program. If you try and just test everything from the outside through the software view, um, you will find that you have a, a semi-infinite number of think paths to test. By breaking things into modules or modular parts, it narrows the paths and allows us uh, better combination coverage. Um, the problem though is that module is not a fixed term. I sometimes see books say, well, there's unit testing and there's module testing as a separate thing. Indeed, Rex Black, differentiates between component testing and unit testing. Um, but his testing of unit, um, his definition, very simply, testing of a small element or unit of the system. Very open definition, not very specific. Um, it doesn't really help us very much. Um, again, it's a very loose idea. and But the important idea that we've discovered is that unit cannot just simply be paradigm dependent, because if somebody says a unit test is a test of a procedure, then what does that mean if I'm working in an object oriented language? Um, so uh, there is this idea, uh, it's a very clear one as well. If I've got a module of multiple procedures or multiple functions, if I test the public functions, what am I doing about the private functions? Well, they're also tested transitively. Um, am I saying that's not a unit test? These, these terms are very vague. So if we can't find the perfect definition, and sadly history does not provide us with the perfect definition, then perhaps we can find a definition that is useful, one that helps us. And that's um, very much the aim and what we've found um, since agile development became a thing, pretty much the triggered by extreme programming, but became much more aware in the early 2000s. Um, people started saying, well, we're unit testing, but we need to differentiate between things. And sometimes they did it based on performance. In other words, we want tests that are fast as opposed to tests that are slow. But people also realized that there was better feedback on our dependency structure, that our tests can tell us something about our architecture. So this definition from Michael Feathers, a set of unit testing rules, um, I think this blog post was from 2005. Um, a test is not a unit test if it talks to the database, it communicates across the network, it touches the file system, it can't run at the same time as any of your other tests. We have to do special things to your environment, such as editing config files to run it. Now, he does, he's not saying that other tests are necessarily bad, but what he's doing is he's talking about this idea. We're going to say unit is not to do with language construct because that makes it paradigm brittle. Unit is to do with what I can separate and isolate easily. Um, J.B. Rainsberger provides an opposite uh, or a counterpoint that shows the other side of this um, in a 2009 blog post. Um, uh, which goes by the title, integrated tests are a scam. In other words, he's definitely encouraging you to do more uh, unit tests than integration tests. But he says, I use the term integrated test to mean any test whose result, pass or fail, depends on the correctness of the implementation of more than one piece of non-trivial behavior. And that kind of fits a little bit with the previous one. The non-trivial, that's hard to define. Um, this is kind of useful. I think that coupled with Michael's is quite a useful one. As it happens, two years before JB wrote this, 2007, I wrote a piece where I said that the most useful definition that we can find is that of a unit test is a test of behavior whose success or failure is wholly determined by the correctness of the test and the correctness of the unit under test. That basically means if you are touching uh, the database, 
talking to the outside world, um, meddling with the file system. It is entirely possible that your code is correct, that the test code is correct, and your test will still fail because the outside world is incorrect. So that's what we're doing is we're basically isolating this. And we can actually use this constructively. This is why I say this is not the true definition of unit test, but it is one of the most useful definitions because it tells us about our system. So if we imagine here's our code, let's break it into three parts. And the three parts of interest, here's the part that is unit testable. Everything here, does no, there's no externalities involved. Um, everything is easy to isolate, easy to test, whether it's a single class, a collaboration of classes, um, a tree of functions, doesn't matter. I don't need to interact with the outside world. There are no special permissions. And typically my tests are gonna be fast unless we're dealing with really long-term calculations. Then there is a portion of my code that is necessarily not unit testable. And that's quite important because we're saying some of your code has to talk to the outside world. Some of your code, its job is to interact with things that are unreliable and non-trivial and are, live across boundaries of, um, uh, live on the other side of boundaries of trust and control. And so that's fine. The problem category is this one. This is the category that is, a, a, is the difficult one. It should be unit testable, ah, but it isn't. In other words, if you describe it to somebody, you go, yeah, that should be unit testable. I, I think that works. And actually you discover, yeah, maybe, maybe it's not. Um, that is where your problem lies. So let's um, talk about another thing that people talk about when they talk about uh, unit tests. Coverage. This is an interesting one because coverage is, uh, well, let, I'll start with what Martin Fowler said in um, uh, one of his blogs. From time to time, I hear people asking what value of test coverage, also called code coverage, they should aim for or stating their coverage levels with pride. Now, normally these are quoted as a percentage and there's something here that I think is worth clarifying. And indeed, uh, Martin, it's a trap that Martin falls into. There is no such thing as a code coverage or the code coverage metric. There is always a code coverage. When somebody says our code coverage is 80%, what kind of code coverage? I know which one it is, but I ask somebody. The questions are very powerful. It's statement coverage. It's not branch coverage. It's not condition coverage. It's not value coverage. There are lots of different kinds of coverage. People report statement coverage as a percentage because one, it's easy to get the number. Two, it's easy to make that number big. It is entirely possible to create tests that touch every single line of code, but they do not touch or they do not explore all of the pathways. So be really careful. Use the language precisely. Try and avoid just saying our, uh, you know, our coverage is 80%. Say our statement coverage is 80%. That just reminds you that there are other kinds, but don't get too excited uh, about this. And importantly, as Martin says, such statements miss the point. Brian Marrick uh, makes this observation. I expect a high level of coverage. Sometimes managers require one. There's a subtle difference. And I want to go into that expectation and that difference. What is the difference here? What is the difference he's referring to? Um, so one of my interests um, is language, um, although I'll say my knowledge of Russian is almost non-existent. Um, I, I'm interested in language linguistics, um, language usage, words, and I run a page on Facebook called Word Friday, and every now and then on a Friday I will feature a word that is interesting, um, a word or phrase, and here's a term I, defy, I put up a few years ago, uh, Goodhart's Law. Once a metric becomes a target, it loses its meaning as a measure, and it's named after an economist um, from the London School of Economics, and he observed an observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed upon it for control purposes. There is a big difference between making an observation and then forcing that to be a control. That is very, very different and people will respond differently. But let me go to this other thing. Um, 100%. I, I'm currently running a uh, training course with um, uh, on test driven development uh, with uh, a friend of mine, John Jagger. And he made a really interesting observation about something he's been working on. And he says, normally, his, his, uh, since he built the system, he's always made sure his test coverage is 100%. It's very easy to do once you're, if you're building the system in cycles, whether you're using short cycles or long cycles, if you're doing that, 100% is absolutely, is not even a, remotely a challenge. 100% is only a challenge for a code base that has not been tested. At that point, 100% 
is like the top of the mountain. But if you're always testing, 100% is not even not even remotely a challenge. It's what you expect. Right back to Brian Merrick's thing. But what John made a, a really important point about is he said, the minute it drops below 100%, I know I'm either missing a case or I've got some dead code. That is the benefit. If you are able to keep this number high, once you've got it, keep it. The challenge we have, 100% is not a challenge for new code. 100% is only a challenge for code that does not have tests, which is one of the reasons Michael Feathers often describes legacy code as being, uh, uh, or in his uh, book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code, he defined legacy code as code without tests. That is why. Once you have 100%, keep it. The minute it drops below, you're either missing some tests or you've got dead code. And this is the really important thing, uh, observation. I was asked a couple of years ago, what, what suggestions do you have for dealing with dead code? I said, find it, delete it. It's as simple as that. Don't leave it around. What's it doing? It's not adding value. Um, it's just confusing people. Uh, you have a version control system to remember it for you. Um, it's not a technical challenge to get rid of uh, dead code. It's, a, it's, a, it's an organizational, it's a mental challenge. We can even see the history of this kind of thinking. Um, the history of the test first cycle goes back to the 1970s. Um, Alfred Aho, who is the A in AUK, Aho Weinberger Kernigan, um, made an observation. We instituted a rigorous regression test for all the features of AUK. Any of the three of us who put in a new feature into the language first had to write a test for the new feature. This way, they made sure that they always had high coverage. In fact, we can even say that the goal of um, something like test-driven development is you always want 101% coverage because what you're doing is you're always asking more from the code than it currently offers. That allows you, so you overstep what you actually have. You've got 100%, now I'm going to write coverage. I'm going to demand that a piece of code exists. I have higher coverage than I have code. Yeah. Clearly that's an impossibility, but it's a way of thinking about it. So uh, let's have a look at an example for the last 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to make it real. I'm going to pick on a very simple example related to um, uh, time management, time handling. I'm going to pick on the leap years. Leap years are, um, this year was a leap year. We had February the 29th. Uh, many people, uh, I, I think it's a, I like this problem because many people think that it's easy and yet they're unable to test it or describe it accurately. And this gets to the other point. When we're talking about unit testing, we are talking about communication. We are not merely testing that something is correct. So I'm going to do this in C sharp. Clearly the lessons generalize across. So a lot of people, when they start out testing, they say, right, I've got a function here. It's, it is leap year. I need to find out where I need to test it. So they come up with a function called test. That's not a very good name. Maybe they make it more specific. Yeah. And then they start adding test smells. This is a classic smell. Test that something is correct. Test that something is okay. Test that something works. These are really common test smells. At this point, you're not really telling the reader what you're trying to do. I think it's kind of obvious that you're testing that something works. Um, and you probably got a lot of code in there. Probably covers a lot of cases. Perhaps you should split it up. Now, the danger is that if you split it up, you end up with ad hoc tests, they're arbitrary. You know, I look at that test one, test two, that tells me if I'm trying to communicate to the reader, this is absolutely useless. It tells me you have two test cases, but I, I've learned nothing else. The, chat, the goal here is to communicate the domain, talk about the domain. Leap years is a domain, okay? It has rules. It's a very small domain, it's not like your business domain, but can you express what it is? What are they, tell me what's important in it. Well, there are leap years and non-leap years. Oh, okay. Now we're getting somewhere. And we might have a couple of cases here. Um, 2020 is a leap year. 2000 is a leap year. However, there's a thing here that there's something here that's not quite right because actually the reason that 2000 is a leap year is actually for a different reason than 2020 is a leap year. There are two kinds of year. Okay, there are two kinds of leap year. Well, perhaps I should have more test cases that make this explicit. Test 2020 is a leap year. Test 2000 is a leap year. Test 2019 is not a leap year. Test 1900 is not a leap year. Now, this also starts revealing something. Um, 1900 is not a leap year in the Gregorian calendar, but it was in the Julian calendar. So in Russia, there was, 1900 was a leap year, but it shows you, but um, uh, elsewhere, it was not. And um, so this is kind of an important one because what it does is it starts telling us about the shape of the domain. Oh, right, this is the Gregorian calendar. But let's just assume I don't know anything about leap years or calendars. I just see four numbers there and I don't know what the relationship is. So you haven't actually told anybody anything. You've just put some hard-coded literals in. 
Let's get rid of the word test because it's noise. We know it's a test because it's got the word test in front of it. Yeah, that's what the annotation's for. 2020 is a leap year. Okay, now one of the things we're going to find is that test cases can end up with really long names. So, um, but also test cases are not part of your normal code. So feel free to step outside of the usual conventions. In .NET, it's very common to use camel case or Pascal case. So, but here, I'm, I'm going to use a much more sentence-based style. I'm going to use underscores. I'm going to use separation. Let's get rid of all the other stuff and just talk about the numbers as we see them. Now, these names are not bad. They, they do categorize. There are four kinds of year that we're interested in. But the problem is that these numbers are not important because I could easily replace them. I could replace 2000 with uh, 2400. I could replace 1900 with 2100. And it says the same kind of idea. What we've done here is we've made a mis we've mistaken the the example for the rule, and the example is not the rule in this case. This is the rule, or this is getting close to the rule. The idea of years to being divisible by four, the leap years, yeah, twenty twenty years, divisible by four hundred are leap years, yeah, not divisible by four are not leap years, divisible by one hundred are not leap years. This is the statement of the rule. Now the numbers here, these are not examples; these are numbers from the domain. The, the rule, the leap year rule is defined in terms of the numbers 4, 100, and 400. So those numbers are safe. The fact that 2020 is one of, is happens to be divisible by four is not important to the test name because it's not part of the rule. It's merely an example. Let's reorder these a little bit so that we go from the most general category. The year's not divisible by four. That's most years. And the most prog progress through to divisible by 400 is the most specific. Every 400 years, we have a leap year. Every 100 years that's not 400, we don't have a leap year. Now, if you look at what I just, if you listen to what I just said and you look at the names, that's not, those names aren't good enough because we've just said, for example, years divisible by 100 are not leap years. But for any year divisible by 400 is also divisible by 100. So we need to clarify the names. Now, again, it makes these longer. But now we have the rule. This is the leap year rule. Okay, it's as simple as that. We have now communicated to the reader. We are not testing that our code works. We're actually explaining to the reader what we mean by it works. If you join a new, if you join a new team, you don't normally say, <laughs> somebody doesn't normally say, hey, here's the code and here's the tests. You know, you don't say, does it work? Your, your challenge is, what do we mean by it works? This is what we mean. This is what we're talking about. We're trying to use our unit tests as a means of explanation, a means of expression. And notice what we just did there. We kept refining, refactoring the names because we are learning how to talk about it. And I think it's an often overlooked feature. Um, one of the reasons you want to test early and often is because you don't know everything to begin with. You are always learning. So the process of testing is learning how to talk about your code. It's learning how to talk about the domain. And your first answers are probably not going to be as good as your later answers. You will get better at doing it because you will understand everything more deeply. Now, there are other testing styles that are that contain equivalent information. Um, this one's from Roy Usheroff. It has exactly the same information, but it's not structured as a sentence. It tells you the target of what you're doing. It tells you the input condition and the result expected. Um, in the BDD community, they tend to like adding the word should, which does make things rather long. Um, if that helps you, absolutely go for it. I tend not to like this because it doesn't sound like you know what you're doing. Eh, should, eh, years not divisible by four, should not be leap years. Is that a yes or a no? Um, so right from a writing style point of view, um, the classic uh, writing style, um, strong and white elements of style, make definite assertions. Um, they were talking about testing here. Avoid tame, colorless, hesitating, non-committal language. And what we discover is when a sentence is made stronger, it usually becomes shorter. This is true, that should is a, is a noise word. Thus brevity is a byproduct of vigor. Brevity is one of our goals. We need it to not be too short, but don't add extra words, omit needless words, as they say. So the style that I favor is informed basically by logical thinking. Um, uh, this is one of the books I learned logic from, which kind of sadly reflects my age. You can tell by the cover of the book and the choice of typeface how old this book is. Um, this is propositional naming. We are naming things as logical propositions. Propositions are vehicles for stating how things are or might be. Okay. We're only interested in indicative sentences, uh, which we can think of as being true or false. 
That's what we want. And what the benefit of this is, let's go back to those names. The benefit of this, of the propositional naming, is that let's present the simple implementation. Okay, that's a, that's a simple implementation. It passes. Everything's green. What that tells you is that everything that you want, uh, you know, this tells you the capabilities that you have. Everything that's green, we have confidence that year is not divisible by four or not leap years. We have confidence. Let's introduce the Julian algorithm instead. What we find is that years divisible by 100, but not by 400 are not leap years. Well, apparently they are leap years. This is the point here is that your tests then become a list of your the capabilities you have confidence in. And anything that you do not have confidence in, it tells you what you don't have rather than what you do have. It's a very clear idea of this is what we, uh, this is what we are missing. It's very specific. It's an act of communication. Um, as Nat Price and Steve Freeman observed um, in a workshop session, are your tests really driving your development? For tests to drive development, they must do more than just test that code performs its required functionality. They must clearly express that required functionality to the reader. That's what we're after. They must be clear specifications. Well, okay, if that's the case, we can do better. Now, I mentioned that the names will get long. We can nest them and we can group them. This is the bit that many people, once they get to the, this step, they get to the previous step, now I've got long names that express a proposition. But the next step is the bit that they're missing. These names have commonality. You help the reader by grouping them. Let me just get rid of all the other stuff. We've got a specification here. A year is a leap year if it is divisible by four, but not by 100. If it is divisible by 400. A year is not a leap year if it is not divisible by four. If it is divisible by 100, but not by 400, so on. We can go in and we can look at the examples and we can see that I've picked a couple of examples here. I picked 2019 and 1900. I could have picked 42 and 100, but I'm choosing 2019 and 1900 because they feel like years. 42 makes me think of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the answer to life, the universe and everything. It would be helpful to have more than one example though. So I could also include edge cases. So perhaps I write this, but what you will find is that many modern frameworks and unit amongst them allow you to separate out. And this shows us we have, um, we can actually parameterize our tests. And there's another way of doing it as well. Parameterize our tests here so that I can show you here is the proposition. Here is the code that is execute, show you the code and here are the values. And it's a very declarative approach. It means there's no mechanics for for loops or anything like that inside your test. And you've got very simple uh, way of achieving better value coverage. And indeed, we can do it for all of these things. Um, um, so I've got this I, for years divisible by 400, I can even use the range operator. Um, now, uh, the things that we also want to observe, um, and I'm just, uh, yeah, yeah, we've got enough time to cover all of this. Um, let me, sometimes when people discover parameterization, they're tempted to say, I don't need all those test methods. They've unfortunately, what they've missed is the point. You're not being taxed for every method you write. The methods are there to tell you, the methods are there to tell you um, what is meant. They convey meaning. That's what we are talking about. Sometimes I see stuff like this and it's just, it's just terrible. Um, a year is either a leap year or not. Well, that kind of covers it. <laughs> you've not said anything there. Um, you've got, apparently you've got big coverage, one to 10,000. Just do not do this. This is just a terrible way of approaching this. Why is it a terrible way? Let's look at the assertion. Notice the expectation logic. That's really complex. It is more likely you will have a bug here than in the production code. Well, perhaps we should extract it to another method. This is identical to the implementation. This is not how you want to go about it. Be specific, as in specification has the word specific at the beginning. Now, I need to put a nod to the fact we've only tested happy day scenarios here. Um, no, I don't read Russian, uh, but this is a quote that I normally use. Um, the English translation, the opening line to Anna Karenina from Leo Tolstoy, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Um, there is the idea of years that are not supported. I'm going to say for the keep things simple, I'm going to reject, um, I'm going to reject the, uh, uh, any year that is 
before the common era, which starts at one. So we're having our calendar model. We've chosen a calendar model. that basically says uh, we are, it's a, what's called a proleptic Gregorian calendar or specifically a proleptic uh, common era Gregorian calendar, year one onwards are treated as Gregorian, everything else we're not supporting. So we're going to reject zero, that's an edge case. People often wonder, is there a zero or not in the calendar? We're just going to make that explicit. We're going to parameterize the other one. If it's negative, we can basically throw an exception and we can catch that, we can express that in an exceptional form. It also makes it clear that we are missing a case. We haven't made it explicit what years are supported. I mean, it's kind of implied that if we're rejecting zero and negative, then maybe the positive ones are supported. But don't let the reader guess. Make the assumption explicit. A year is supported. It does not throw in these cases. What we're saying is an observation made by Butler Lamson back in 1983. <laughs> An interface is a contract to deliver a certain amount of service. Clients of the interface, whether that is a functional, a procedural, an object-oriented, a logic-oriented, whatever style or paradigm you're using, the client of the interface depends on the contract, which is usually documented in the interface specification. Now, what we're doing here is removing that idea, and we're basically saying our tests can express that contract. They don't simply check it. They don't check the code is working. They tell you what we mean by it works. This is the specification of Leap here from our point of view. This is what we are supporting. This is what we are expecting. And because we have made it so public and so visible that if we do get something wrong, if I make a mistaken assumption about which date range we're supporting, um, or which Leap Year algorithm is supporting, I've made it so visible that somebody else is able to see that and communicate with me. And that is a really important point. We cannot see our own assumptions. So in closing, this is what we talk about when we talk about unit testing. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, has answered a few questions and if not raised a few questions and uh, given you some food for thought. Uh, I think we're in a good position now to perhaps take some questions. Um, don't yes, sure. Do hey, you Andre. Me? Yeah, hi, do you hear me? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, okay. We have several questions in chat and let me start with some praises for you. I just will, uh, I just will uh, read some fights. People in chat are talking that you are a great speaker. You say you are talking like uh, playing a music. It's it's really uh, oh, thank you very much. Nice, nice to hear you. And also, they claim that you have all, a very clear language, which is really easy to understand, uh, even for non-native oh, speakers. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, and let me bring some questions. Uh, I will probably start with this question. Uh, uh, Denis Tirentiev asks, I heard that there are an idea to divide programmers and engineers who write unit tests for two, two different kinds of programmers, you know, who write code and mm. who write unit tests. This approach uh, could help to make more fair coverage. What do you think about this approach? Does it make sense? Um, it's one of those ideas that in theory, let's put it this way, it sounds in theory like a good idea, but in practice, it actually um, doesn't work particularly well. Um, and I've seen this fail in a number of cases. So what is the basis of the idea? If we separate these pieces out, the idea is that um, we have some people writing unit tests that are separate from those people who wrote it. Um, and there are two things here that we hope we're gonna get. One is independence. Um, these people are independent of these, so they will think of things differently and see things differently and cover things that these people did not think of. The other thing is that we are also going to speed things up because we've got two independent groupings. The problem is that that doesn't work. Um, in practice, what happens is that these people still need to know what is intended. Um, they won't be independent because these people will tell them what is supposed to do. Also notice we're losing time there. We've taken up communication time. This also becomes a real a real issue because uh, we are now drawing on, we've now got to synchronize these people. They, uh, I'm going to, let's say I'm going to be one of the test um, test writers. I need to wait for the, the developer to, uh, I need to wait for them to tell me what is meant, or I need to wait for them to write a document, or I need to, in other words, I'm now waiting. I've created a wait state. And one of the things that we've learned, you know, through uh, uh, lean approaches and other is that adding wait states slows everything down. So in other words, we've actually lost the fact that where I'm a developer, I'm in front of my IDE, 
there's my code i can test there is nobody that can test it faster than me i am here i don't have to talk to anybody i am here doesn't mean my tests are perfect but they whatever it gets done will be done sooner there's very le little intellectual effort. Now, if I want to get people involved, then perhaps we pair program or mob program. That's a really good way of using other people um, in the group. That is a powerful approach because we have natural synchronization. The other question is that of independence. Um, it turns out people are not as independent as you think. If you're a different uh, group of people, yes, you may see things that are different. You may also miss things that the other person would have got. But because you normally get your information from the source of the person that created the code, they will place some of their assumptions in your head already. There was also a study done about 30 years ago uh, on N version programming, and that's the letter N, um, that historically was used in um, safety critical systems like aircraft. The idea of N version programming is that we're going to develop the software, in fact, the space shuttle had used n version programming it had a four plus one configuration um, you had four pieces of hardware from the same manufacturer they were uh, they ran one piece of software that was developed by one team then you had another um redundant piece of hardware that was different hardware so if there were hardware faults you had a kind of nice voting system here but the software for that was developed by a different team who were independent of the first team the idea is that independence makes it very, very, uh, you, you're, you're improving the possibility that you get something right and you trap errors. Inversion programming is based on this idea of independence. What they discovered in various studies is that uh, people make the most, on the whole, statistically, they make the same mistakes in the same places. They have the same oversights in the same places because typically they have a common background. They have a similar background in software development or electrical engineering or whatever. They l know the same things. And they also receive their, their knowledge, their initial knowledge from the same specification. So they're already primed. So it's one of those things that sounds good in theory, but in practice, it doesn't work out very well. And I've, I've seen this in companies and it has been, um, it creates long feedback loops that people then start ignoring. I saw this in, um, in Ireland, in Dublin a few years ago. The, the test teams, the unit testers were 45 minutes drive away from the people that wrote the code. And that separation did not help. It just it just made them feel remote. It just meant things didn't get tested. It meant there was always a backlog. Uh, the coverage was always relatively low. There were always questions that were left unanswered. And it was actually a work. You, you now had two teams doing worse work than one team could do. Um, it was less effective and it wasted time. Uh, in another company uh, in Hong Kong, um, they decided they started off with their developers developing the code and the tests but then those developers became senior developers and junior developers recruited and it was decided that the junior de junior developers would write test code because the the time the, the senior developers their time was too valuable to be spent writing tests mm -hmm. um so, so the problem here is what they ended up with was the junior developers because their time is value the, t the senior developer time is valuable. The junior developers simply did not ask the senior developers what was meant. And what they did is they looked at the code and they wrote tests for what they saw, which basically means that they tested that the code did what the code did. And they did that for 200,000 lines. And then it turns out they had a few bugs in production that they could not identify because their tests tested that those bugs were correct because they had simply tested, well, put it, put it another way, they tested the compiler worked. You know, no. So they see an if statement, they go, oh, there's two branches. Oh, I need to test that one and that one. You're testing the compiler. You're not actually testing. You're not testing the, the question. Remember I said questions are important. Should it do this? Should that condition be the case? Should this be the response? That's the bit that's important. So I think that although in theory that separation feels like a good idea, the evidence suggests this is not a good idea, and there are very good reasons that it's not effective. But that doesn't mean you cannot make use of those different skills, but do it together. In other words, treat the activity of writing the test as a collaborative activity. At that point, you're making the best use of everybody's information and their time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would, I would also even add my opinion that it's even in theory, yeah. it's not a good idea, because this didn't develop. Yeah, well, it's yeah, I think you're. I think you're right. I mean, I'm saying in theory, if we take a very narrow view of theory, then it makes a good idea. But the minute you start bringing in all the other assumptions, it's like, oh, actually, that doesn't even work on paper. Yes, you're you're quite right. Just, uh, the development is about development, not about test. It should drive development. Exactly. It should help yeah, thinking it, through. 
It's that uh, term that uh, Nat and Steve use. Are your tests really driving your development? That's the that's the key that I think we're missing sometimes. Yes, exactly. So uh, probably it's also answered for the next question from Anton. Uh, how to motivate developers to test more without forcing coverage level as a KPI? That is a really yeah. That's a really good yeah. Um, a really good question. Um, so let's let's change our words a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let, the, the pro, I get this question a lot. How to force developers? Now, the first thing I'm going to say is that when people are forced to do something, um, they will often react against that, or rather, they will only do it because they they are being forced to. Some developers won't do it because because they are being forced to. Um, so we need to take into account human psychology. Um, uh, and if you've got children, this is sometimes a little bit easier. If you tell your child that they can't do something, they're probably going to do it. If you tell your child that they must do something, they probably won't do it. You know, you must eat your vegetables. Ah, you know, they're, they're going to react against it. So the thing here is what you're trying to do is create a situation where writing tests feels more natural than not writing tests. And that starts telling us it's the creation of the situation. Um, so uh, do, is there a sim single answer? Coverage is part of the answer, but we just need to be very careful what we do with that number, because the minute we start pushing on it, it will bite back. Um, what else can we do that makes people feel more comfortable? Uh, lead by example. Um, if you're, a, if you're a, a tech lead, a team lead, lead by example, um, write tests, uh, involve other people in writing the tests. Um, when you're doing reviewing, this is one of the things I think is important about reviewing and reviewing together. Um, when you're doing reviews, sometimes it's helpful to start writing tests in the review. Do you mean like this? Again, as I said earlier, is what you're trying to do is describe an example. Uh, you're trying to specify intent. Uh, I actually did this once with the team where we did the code, but I didn't write it initially as tests. I just wrote it as example code um, on a whiteboard. Then I moved it to an editor and I said, oh, well, let's just keep writing these example code. And then eventually I stuck assertions on the end of them. So the idea is show how easy it can be. Um, look at improvements in coverage. So in other words, the goal is to improve the coverage rather than to reach 70%. Um, but also you need to track it with any metric that you're using. Uh, I often caution people against using a metric, only one metric, use it in balance with something else. Tell us about our defects. Um, tell us about uh, the technical debt. Try and show how over time that does. So in other words, you need to encourage. So there's no fixed answer. You have to run a lot of experimentation. And I demonstrated, I showed the PDSA cycle. That's an experimentation cycle. So that is how I would improve. I wouldn't offer one guide. I would say, try experimenting and see how people respond. Oh, right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you uh -huh. for your answers. You're welcome. And Kevin, thank you for your talk. Andre, thank you for thank you. supporting with the questions and answers from our audience. Uh, I guess that's uh, kind of it for this session. And I remind you that we have a special Zoom chat where you can, which you can join and continue discussion, continue asking questions and answering them. And for the best question, uh, we will get a prize kind of for winner. Uh, so thank you and see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. See you Let's in a minute. See you in Zoom.